Hello, and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Home Discovery Series. Today's program is Invasive Insects and Bad Biters with Kyle Shutt, Insect Management Technician with the Schuylkill Conservation District. Hello, everyone. Kyle, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jamie Dawson. I'm the Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, and we are so glad that everyone in our audience is joining us today as well. As you may know, Hawk Mountain is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey. And we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education locally and globally around the world. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members, we thank you so very much for your continued support. And if you're joining us today and you're not a member, we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone remains safe and healthy during these times of COVID challenges, and we are thrilled to offer our local and global community a variety of free virtual programming. As always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates and depends on donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program is being recorded. The video will then be accessible on Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website directly connecting you to our YouTube channel. At any point during today's program, viewers may submit questions through the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform. We've designated time at the end of the program to take some questions from the audience. And we are so excited that Kyle is joining us today to teach us all about spotted lanternflies, mosquitoes and ticks, and what we can do to protect ourselves from them. And before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to share some of Kyle's background experience with our audience. Kyle is originally from Berks County and graduated with a bachelor's degree in biology from Shippensburg University in 2018. Kyle started with the Schuylkill Conservation District in May of 2018 with the Mosquito-Borne Disease Control Program and has since expanded to include a spotted lanternfly control program and tick surveillance program. So Kyle, how did you become so knowledgeable about insects? Um, it was basically all on the job training. Um, I started with this right out of college. Um, and I, you know, I landed with the DEP mosquito program. Um, I got some live training from them my first three days. And then it was pretty much off and running with the program. And then we picked up um, the spotted lanternfly, lanternfly program um, two Novembers ago, and that was the same kind of deal. Um, you know, gain that knowledge out in the field um, and work with the Department of Ag on that program a little bit and then kind of, you know, work our program out um, and try to, you know, get where we are with our treatments now and our education events. Nice, nice. And I, I know that you, you immediately after graduating college became connected with the Schuylkill Conservation District. How did you become um, interested in, in working with them? Um, it was actually through, I believe my advisor at college, um, you know, they had just sent out some job openings um, and it was fairly close um, to home. So I figured I'd apply um, and I actually got talking with Porcupine Pat through email because he was the interim manager at that point. Um, and, you know, we exchanged some emails. I came out for an interview and then um, I started, you know, two days after I graduated. Wonderful. Yay. And I'm glad that you mentioned Porcupine Pat because that reminded me that I wanted to give a shout out to Porcupine Pat and say thank you for, for connecting you with me because um, I, he connected us for this program. So wonderful. And Kyle, just very uh, quickly, if you don't mind sharing that you do work with Hawk Mountain Sanctuary uh, with your with your job from time to time is that correct do you mind explaining that a little yep um so last year i went down and worked with the trail crew um and we did a test site we did some tree of heaven treatments to try to get rid of one of the stands down there um and we did do some insecticide treatments for some random flies that you guys had down there mm -hmm. um, and then i was able to work it out through the grant that i could um donate some treatment supplies um, to the trail crew for this year. Um, so that worked out pretty well. And we just got that stuff down there the other week. So hopefully, um, you know, that helps out down there. And it sounds like they were doing a real good job of controlling the tree of heaven and trying to get rid of the lanternfly. 
and thank you so much for the donations. We love that, so thank you. <laughs> so, um, Kyle, I'm gonna turn it over to you to teach us about invasive insects and bad biters. Um, so we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay, so now we should have the PowerPoint up. And as Jamie mentioned, I'm Kyle Shutt. I'm the insect management tech for the Schuylkill Conservation District. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the insects that I deal with with my program, um, one being the spotted lanternfly and the other two being mosquitoes and ticks. So to start off, I always like to talk about what an invasive species is. Um, so basically, an invasive species is any non-native insect, plant, bird, fish, um, animal, or even something as small as bacteria, and it can wreak havoc on a habitat or ecosystem, and that's what makes them um, invasive, that they're very competitive with native species, and a lot of times they can just dominate um, the ecosystem, and they will cause damage um, either you know, economically or ecologically. And some of the pictures I have here, um, the fish, that's a snakehead um, that's invading some of our waters. There's a European starling. And then of course, um, the spotted lanternfly, which I'm going to touch base on. So basically, spotted lanternfly was native to China, India, and Vietnam. And it was brought over to Pennsylvania in 2014. Pennsylvania is actually the first place that they were discovered um, right down in Berks County. And currently we are seeing um, infestations in 14 of the southeastern PA counties, but we're also seeing um, pop-up populations or single individuals um, in places like New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, and North Carolina. And the problem with the lanternfly is they have no native predators here in the United States, um, and they're actually known to feed on 70 different types of plants, with the preferred host being the tree of heaven. Um, but some of those plant species that they do feed on other than the tree of heaven um, are apples, grapes, um, peaches, you know, different orchard species of plants, and then just some succulent plant species. And right now, where we're seeing the spotted lanternfly in Pennsylvania, um, you can see on the map on the left, those 14 southeastern counties that are highlighted um, are seeing the worst of the infestations right now. And the map on the right was updated uh, most recently in 2018. But all of the green dots are reports that were suspected to be um, spotted lanternfly. And the red dots were ones that actually turned out to be spotted lanternflies. So you can see that they're clustered in southeastern Pennsylvania. And I always like to show this map. Um, this was updated more recently, but it gives an idea of where we were seeing spotted lanternfly. Um, you know, pretty much up the entire East Coast. You can see the blue states um, in Pennsylvania and even into New Jersey um, and West Virginia and Virginia. Um, those are counties that have adopted a quarantine to try to stop the movement of spotted lanternflies. So they have seen, um, you know, a little bit higher numbers of the lanternfly, whereas the counties that are highlighted in yellow are ones that may have seen, you know, an isolated population or you know, found a few adults or maybe an egg mass, um, and they, you know, don't feel the need to take, um, you know, as extreme measures um, because they feel like they can control their small populations or individuals. And this um, graphic here just shows the potential of spread for the spotted lanternfly. Um, so you can see based on the color coordinations there that the red areas or where they could be expected to spread with high likelihood, um, just based on food resources and um, climate and um, things like possible rain, uh, rainfall totals. And then it radiates out into the medium, which is the yellow color, which is not as suitable a habitat, but there's the possibility. And then down to the low habitat. And then obviously the white is what's unsuitable. So we wouldn't expect to see um, any spotted lanternflies distributed to those areas. And this shows the complete life cycle of the spotted lanternfly. Um, so we'll start with the first instar. Um, that's the first 
stage that hatches out from the egg. And typically we'll see those um, the last few weeks of May, um, depending on the year. If it's a little bit warmer, we'll see them, you know, the end of May. But this year, um, you know, we had some cold snaps through the beginning of May and we didn't see the warm weather really start until June. So those instars were, you know, about two weeks late. I didn't see the first ones here in Schuylkill County, um, I think till like June 8th. And then as we move across, we'll see the second instars um, and they'll molt, you know, a few weeks after they hatch out. And then the third instars, you know, we'll also see those in that June, July period. Um, and those first three stages are very, diff very difficult to tell the difference between. Um, they do grow in size very slightly, um, but they have the same colorations um, and they're typically feeding on, you know, the same types of trees. They're feeding on the same places on the trees. Um, so it's tough to tell between those. And now, right now, we're seeing mostly fourth in stars. Um, we did start to see our first few adults over the last week and a half. But most of the lanternflies you're going to see right now are going to be those fourth in stars with that red coloration that develops on their back. And um, as we get, you know, further into August, we're going to see a big transition into mostly adults. Um, and then they will start to lay their eggs early fall. A lot of times we see that mid-September, end of September, and they will hang around um, till we get our first couple hard frosts of the year. So that, you know, varies. Sometimes it's early November, sometimes it's late, maybe even into December. Um, but until that time, they get very sluggish. Um, and then those frosts will kill them off. And the lanternflies actually overwinter as eggs. Um, and you can see that last picture there shows what an egg mass looks like. And I will um, cover that a little bit more and get some better pictures so you can see what that is. But that's where we start our control efforts um, actually throughout winter trying to get rid of those egg masses. So here are some more pictures um, of what the egg masses look like. Uh, that far picture on the right hand or on the left hand side of the screen is an egg mass. Um, and that would probably be, you know, around March, April, um, just because of the cracks on the egg mass, it starts to dry out from winter. Um, usually when they're first laid, they're very glossy. They're even a little bit more gray colored. Um, and then as they begin to weather throughout the, the winter, they start to get that cracked appearance. So that's what a lot of people notice um, in early spring when they, you know, we all get back outside and we start moving around. Um, that's pretty much what you'll see. But the females actually don't cover all of their eggs for one reason or another. Um, you know, a female may cover an egg mass or she may not. So the top right hand picture there is what eggs look like when they're not covered, um, you know, with that protective coating. So each one of those little, I call them like grains of rice, that's an individual egg. Um, and the females usually lay anywhere between 30 and 50 eggs together. And it's very easy um, for these egg masses to get moved. A lot of times they could be on, um, you know, lawn furniture, even on, you know, different types of farm equipment, um, you know, your cars. If you let them let that stuff sit throughout the winter, um, you know, they'll hang on there. Then you fire that stuff up again in the spring, start moving it around. You know, those eggs could get transported um, and then start to hatch in a new area. And one of the first things we do, like I said, throughout winter and in early spring is look for these egg masses. And the best way to remove them is to scrape them. Um, you can use anything from a short piece of stick um, that's shown there in the picture, or I know we give out scraper cards. A lot of counties give out scraper cards along with the Department of Ag, um, which is basically, you know, just like a credit card, um, except ours, you know, has some information about the lanternfly. But if you just press it up against the surface where the egg masses are um, and scrape, you know, down in a firm motion, um, those eggs will pop out of the, the covering. And usually we put them into a bag that has a little bit of hand sanitizer in it or a bottle. Like, so on the, like is on the screen and you can screw a lid on it, um, you know, and throw those away. And the reason we put the alcohol or the hand sanitizers in there is that pretty much just fries the eggs on contact. Um, so we know that those, you know, aren't going to get reopened um, and hatch out. And just to cover the first to third um, in star stages a little bit, um, you know, they're very similar, like I mentioned. Um, typically, we see them the end of May. And they're very, very tiny when they first hatch. Um, I believe what they measured them at is like a 16th of an inch, an eighth of an inch when they first come out of their egg masses. Um, you know, so it can be tough to see 
if you do have an infestation in your backyard in early spring, um, if you wouldn't notice the egg masses, these guys could hatch out. And if they're hiding, you know, in the upper part of the trees um, or in the bushes, you might not notice them until they get to that fourth instar stage or the adult stage. Um, and this is actually the time that we use our sticky traps um, to catch these smaller instars. Um, it works well on them because they're not strong enough to get through the trap. Um, once they get to the fourth instars and adults, uh, they get a little bit stronger and can actually move through the bands. Um, but let me back it up here one more time. But what we do with the bands, um, I know, you know, a lot of times people think that we get a lot of bycatch with those, um, but typically we cut them down to four inches, um, which is half the size. They usually come in eight and a half inch rolls, um, but half inch of the band isn't sticky. So we'll cut that in half and that reduces the surface area. Um, and we were running, I believe 125 um, sticky traps this spring and we didn't get any bycatch, um, you know, no birds, no mammals. The only thing we caught um, were insects. And another route you could go if you wanted to keep the band the full size, um, you know, or you didn't want to go through the process of cutting it. We put, um, you know, wire meshing around it and that keeps um, a barrier that doesn't let any mammals get in contact with the band, but it lets the lanternflies walk up the tree um, and get through that mesh to get to the sticky band. In the fourth stage, um, you know, you can really see that red coloration start to come out um, and they do get a bit bigger. Um, these will be roughly half an inch in length. Um, they're a lot stronger, like I said, so we usually pull our sticky bands off once we see a large majority of the fourth in stars um, and they'll continue to feed on some of the same resources you know as the first to third in stars so we still see those in the in the same area and then the adults they're going to emerge that late summer and you know we'll see them all the way to the first hard freeze the male and females are very similar looking um, if we were to look at them you know from the top like the picture on the bottom left there um, you know it'd be tough to tell the difference the only Real way is to see that yellow coloration um, when the female starts to develop eggs, her abdomen will begin to expand and show that yellow coloration a little bit more than the males. Um, and that's due to her heavy feeding and the egg growth. And then um, it should be in a picture later, but if you would flip the lanternfly over, there would actually be um, two red marks um, towards the bottom of the abdomen on the female that the male wouldn't have. Um, and they do have a very large mouth part that allows them to feed. The next picture here should show that um, highlighted there in the red box. So that's that mouthpiece actually works like a drill and it'll bore into the tree and they'll get into the natural sap flow of the tree because they don't have real well-developed um, muscles in their mouth to actually draw in the sap. They just get into the natural flow and engorge themselves um, using that mouthpiece. And I do have a video here that I would like to play. Um, I'll get it fired up. I'll just talk about it a little bit. Um, but basically, it shows how lanternflies um, move to different areas to feed. Um, so a lot of times, they do hop from food source to food source. They're very good jumpers. Um, but we do see them climb to tall areas, so they get to the tops of trees. Um, in, you know, cities, they can get to the tops of buildings or the tops of, um, you know, ridges, and they'll actually jump and they'll catch um, the breeze and they'll just glide to new destinations. So this video should show that. Um, if you can see highlighted against the clouds there, all the black specks that are going by, those are lanternflies that are making their way into um, a vineyard. So they're, you know, riding the breeze in and they're going to look to feed on those grapes that are in there. Move to the next slide here. There we go. Um, so I'm also going to talk about the tree of heaven. Um, which is one of the main food sources of the lanternfly. Um, tree of Heaven is a very invasive tree species. It looks very similar to some native species that we have here. 
I know um, it looks very similar to some sumac that we have, um, and it's even comparable to uh, the wal walnuts that we have. But these trees have, you know, almost no value to native insects or animals. Um, you know, we really don't see any other insects feeding on them, feeding on the leaves. Uh, we don't, you know, see a ton of birds utilizing them for nesting or anything like that. But the problem with these guys is they're very difficult to remove and manage, and they will grow almost anywhere. But they really prefer disturbed areas. So a lot of times we'll see them in new developments along roadsides or, you know, anywhere where there's land clearing. These could be one of the first ones to pop up. And the problem with them is they can produce so many seeds. Um, one female tree can produce upwards of a quarter million seeds, and they do root sucker. Um, so the problem with that is, you know, you could have one main tree that's leaving seeds, and then you could get 30, 40 more trees that root sucker off those, and you create a very dense stand that doesn't let sunlight to the ground, and then, um, you know, your area gets dominated by the tree. And looking at, you know, what damage that the lanternflies cause, why we have a program trying to eradicate them, um, you know, the pictures across the bottom there, you can see that they're trees loaded with lanternflies. Um, so obviously no one wants that in their backyard, but all stages will feed on different plants and trees. Um, so they're taking nutrients away from that tree. And if you look in the picture in the bottom middle there, um, that's actually mold that's growing on a leaf. Um, and the reason that mold's growing is because the lanternflies secrete honeydew, which is just undigested sap because they're feeding um, and engorging themselves in so much sap they can't process it all. And then um, they excrete this honeydew and a lot of times it covers lower level leaves um, and it's very sugary. And then that promotes mold growth, which um, you know is gonna stop that plant from being able to go through photosynthesis um, if their leaves are all covered with that. It's almost like a black tar substance. It's very sticky, um, it's very tough to get rid of. Um, so, you know, that combination of the lanternflies feeding on the trees, um, you know, they could be covering different leaves on the trees. Um, when they pull that mouthpiece out of the tree, there's actually going to be a feeding wound on the tree. So a lot of times in the fall, if, you know, once the adults are gone, um, if I'm out looking for places where there might have been lanternflies feeding in the fall, I'll look at the trees and see if there's sap runs down the tree. Um, and if there's a ton of sap runs and you can pinpoint where those started, that's actually where lanternflies would have been feeding in the fall. And another problem with the honeydew is because it is, um, you know, a sugary substance, a lot of times it'll coat the bottom of the trees and we'll see um, a lot of native pollinators flying around, um, you know, trying to get to that sugar and that honeydew, but that's taking them away from their, you know, native pollinator setting. Um, so they're not, you know, transferring pollen between the flowers there, you know, going after this honeydew that's around the bottom of the trees. Um, so that's also a problem. And then consecutive years of excessive feeding on trees, um, you know, such as the picture on the bottom right there, could actually cause the plants to die. Um, typically, we don't see it, you know, in one season. If it is, you know, a strong, healthy tree, um, it'll take consecutive years of lanternfly feeding on the sap to kill that tree. And a lot of times it's because that tree then gets secondary infections from all the holes in the bark um, and the weakening of the tree from losing the sap um, and getting loose leaves covered. They usually get, you know, a bacterial disease um, that will eventually kill the tree. And spotted lanternfly is very bad for fruit growers. Um, you know, the pictures at the bottom there, you can see them covering um, the branch of an apple tree, covering a grapevine. Um, a couple of things, like I mentioned earlier, they love to feed on apples, plums, peach trees, and grapevines. And um, we've gotten reports of, you know, different vineyards that have such large infestations of the lanternfly that their vines don't produce any grapes. Um, you know, with a large number of lanternflies feeding on the grape. Um, that plant's just going to focus on surviving. It's not going to push fruit. Uh, so that doesn't help, you know, the farmers in any way when they're trying to get good fruit production. Um, if they have the lanternflies in there, their plants are just going to be focusing on surviving. And the cost of treatment has tripled for fruit growers um, since we've seen the large infestations, you know, now the lanternfly, especially for um, grape vineyards, you know, apple orchards. This has become one of the main um, 
problems in their vineyards um, and where they're spending the most money trying to get rid of these pests. And I always like to include this video just to show how bad lanternfly infestations can get. Uh, this was taken in southeastern PA, I believe in Berks County. Um, and this just shows a video of a tree that's completely infested with spotted lanternfly. So as you can see, that tree is just completely coated. Um, you know, that's one of the worst infestations I've seen on a tree. Um, I do get reports of people say that their trees are covered from, you know, root base to the treetops. Um, they can't see any of the leaves. They can't see any of the bark. The lanterflies are covering every square inch. And it's likely that an infestation like that occurred later in summer, um, even to the point where the females might have been thinking about laying eggs. Um, you know, we do see large gatherings of lanternflies right before they're about to lay eggs. Uh, they do that when they're mating. Um, and, you know, we don't know all the reasons yet, but we also think it shows that that's a good tree to feed on. So some of the other females begin to cluster to that tree um, so they can feed up and, you know, get their egg production going. So we do see huge clusterings, um, you know, September, middle of September, even towards the beginning of October. Um, and that's why we try to get this program developed throughout summer and try to get some of our treatments done um, in July and August. So we can try to prevent the large gatherings like that on people's property. I am going to switch over now um, to the other portion of my program. Um, so I'm going to talk about mosquitoes, which I call the bad biters, and then I will also, um, you know, talk a little bit about the tick surveillance program that I run. But basically, the mosquitoes of Pennsylvania. So we have over 60 species of mosquitoes in Pennsylvania. A lot of people think, you know, we, there's just one mosquito out there, but we have a lot of different species that all live in different habitats. Um, and you know, based on what your backyard layout's like. Um, you know, what kind of wood you have, what kind of water you have in your backyard. You could have very different mosquitoes, um, you know, for someone a couple streets down from you. And only the female mosquitoes bite. Um, you know, a lot of people think every mosquito bite bites, but it's just the females. Um, and they do that because they're looking to take a blood meal so they can produce their eggs. Um, and they have nutrients so they can lay their eggs. And females will lay their eggs in standing water. Um, the water can't have any real flow to it. If it does, it'll just, you know, take those eggs right out from where the female laid them. And then the larvae that hatches out of the eggs can't really stay in any kind of moving water. They're not strong enough. So really anything, you know, bird baths, trash cans that fill up with water, five gallon buckets, uh, those are all great areas uh, for, you know, the mosquitoes to lay eggs. That water heats up very nicely um, and has no flow to it. So those are great breeding areas for mosquitoes. And then of course, the reason why we have the program is because mosquitoes are notorious for passing along disease. And specifically in our program, we look for mosquitoes that have West Nile virus. So a little bit about the mosquito life cycle. Um, we'll start with a female mosquito um, at the top there. And she has already taken a blood meal. So she's able to produce her eggs, which she's gonna lay on the surface of the water. Um, those eggs after, you know, a day or two are going to hatch out and they'll be mosquito larvae and they'll stay at that stage and they'll feed um, on plant matter in the water for another day or two. Then they'll turn to the pupa and they'll actually stop feeding when they're pupa and they'll put all their energy towards turning into adults. And then the last stage um, is them emerging from the water as an adult ready to fly and um, looking for a blood meal. And this video um, is just gonna show how a female mosquito lays her eggs on the surface of the water. Um, they actually float, we call them egg rafts. So, you know, they don't break the surface tension of the water, they'll float around and they actually have a little bit of a sticky coating. Um, so the eggs all stay together in one raft um, and they don't move around separately. You can 
see she's laying each individual egg um, and it sticks right to the cluster of eggs that's already there. And as soon as she's done laying those eggs, um, she flies off as fast as she can. She doesn't get stuck um, in the water or break the tension of the surface. And this next video is just going to show um, the stages of the mosquito larvae and pupa um, after they hatch out from the eggs. So they live in the standing water, they feed on plant material in the water. They actually um, almost have like gill structures that filter out real small organic matter. Um, and then they have two tail-like structures that stick out of the back and that's actually how they breathe. So they have to come to the surface um, and breathe that way. So one of our treatments is to, you know, put a small film layer over the water. Um, and we only do that in, you know, areas where it's just mosquito larvae, so we'll target, you know, artificial containers like buckets or tires. Um, we'll put a small layer um, of actually just um, mineral oil over the surface, and that stops the mosquito larvae from being able to breathe. Um, so we can control them that way, but I'll show you the video. Um, and this just shows how they move and how they wiggle throughout the water column. And you can see how um, the larvae move a little bit differently than the pupa. Um, you know, they kind of just twist and wiggle around, whereas um, when one of the pupa moves, they kind of tumble and they roll throughout the water column. But the pupa don't move as much as the larvae because they're not feeding anymore. They're not trying to take any organic matter. Um, they're kind of just in a resting state, um, transforming, transforming themselves to the adult stage. And this is just some examples of types of standing water where we see mosquito larvae. So the picture at the top, um, you know, is probably just a natural puddle. Uh, you can see a mix of mosquito larvae. They're the lighter, um, slender pieces in the water and, you know, the dark um, ovals there. That's the pupa. Um, they're more towards the surface. And that's, you know, you know, a natural setting where we'd see mosquitoes, but we can also see them in tree holes um, and tire ruts in people's yards. But some of the artificial places that we see them, tires, buckets, tarps, trash cans are all, you know, great places for them. You can see in that trash can there, all those specks in the water. Each one of those is an individual mosquito larvae. Um, and a lot of times we do see them in floodwater areas. Um, so this, with the big rain that we just, just had the other day, um, you know, a lot of my time is spent going to some known, you know, floodwater areas that I have, um, places that, you know, fill up with water, some woodland pools um, that are only full when we get big rains. I'm always around checking those after big storms, just looking for these mosquito larvae. And we do um, most of our controls on larvae. We try to get them before they get to adults, you know, before they're ready to bite. And they're just easier to control when they're in confined area of water rather than flying around. A little bit about the adult mosquitoes. Um, so this is their final stage. Um, the females are the only ones that feed on blood. And like I said earlier, the blood gives them um, the protein and nutrients they need to make all the eggs. And male mosquitoes don't bite. They actually look for pollen from plants. Um, they have very feathery antenna that helps them with that. And that's one of the differences between the male and female mosquitoes. Um, she won't have the very feathery antennae. Um, if you can see it on the screen there, the males on the left, the females on the right. Um, and they do look a little bit different. Um, you know, the, the mouthpiece on the female um, is a little more defined um, because hers is made to, you know, pierce skin and take a blood meal, whereas the male's looking for pollen, so his isn't as defined as hers. This here is a video that I really like to share. Um, it's a close up of a mosquito taking a blood meal. Um, so you can actually see her mouthpiece work its way in um, to the skin, and then you can see her abdomen start to expand once she begins to fill up on the blood meal. You can see.
see she's trying to work um, her mouthpiece in to find a good blood vessel and place for her to take blood. And then um, you can kind of see her head motion, um, you know, as she's beginning to take the blood meal in. And shortly you should start to see her abdomen expand. And you'll actually see down the center there, it'll start to turn dark um, as she's filling with blood. And the females can take multiple blood meals, um, you know, as they try to fill themselves up so they have enough nutrients to produce the eggs. But a lot of times, um, you know, they like to try to take that from one source. Um, it's a little bit easier because once she starts to fill up with blood, it becomes harder for them to fly and move around. Um, so if they can get what they need from one source, that is easier for them than trying to find a new source while she's, um, you know, three quarters full of her meal. When she's done, she removes that and flies away. And with our program, um, we are looking for West Nile virus. Um, that's one of the most common uh, mosquito transmitted diseases here in Pennsylvania. Um, there are a few others, you know, sometimes we look for triple E um, that made an appearance last summer, but typically, you know, consistently what we're gonna see is the West Nile virus. And actually, it's a bird host that amplifies the virus. Um, so no mosquito hatches out of an egg containing the virus. They actually have to feed on a bird that is infected with the West Nile. And then that gets transferred to the mosquito, you know, through the blood meal. And then once that mosquito looks to take its second or third blood meal of the season, that's when um, the West Nile virus can get passed along to us. Um, you know, or other mammals like horses, um, you know, we typically see the West Nile in those, but we're what's called a dead end host. So if an infected mosquito bites us, we can't replicate the virus um, enough to where another mosquito could feed on us and take, um, you know, the virus from us then. It has to come from a bird host. And a little bit about our mosquito programs and how we help. So um, we set traps all over the county. Um, you know, typically I have 10 traps that I set at the same places every week. Um, I call those fixed sites. So that's how we get baseline uh, mosquito populations. You know, we're setting those all every week um, from May through the end of September, sometimes into October, depending on the weather and the amount of virus we get. Um, and then we have non-fixed sites, um, so I'm free to set those traps at different places around the county. Um, so we get good coverage and good samples from, you know, every corner of the county throughout the summer. And we do send those mosquitoes away to get tested for disease. And, um, you know, those go down to the Harrisburg lab and they individually count each mosquito that gets sent down there. And then they do test those for West Nile. And um, I also spray to kill mosquitoes. Um, so, you know, those pictures at the bottom are techniques that we use here at the county. Um, you know, we'll spray with backpack blowers for mosquito larvae. We can even treat, you know, wood lines if there are, you know, bad adults coming out of a certain section of woods. And then if we do get a lot of West Nile um, positive samples in the county, we can break out the truck sprayer um, if we're looking to knock down populations throughout an entire town. And ways that the public can help, um, or you can help in your own backyard, is to make sure that you're eliminating standing water. Um, so if you don't have things like buckets that collect water in your backyard, you know, or tires, um, even food, pet food bowls, um, if they collect enough water, they can um, breed mosquitoes. Wearing mosquito repellent um, is a great way to keep yourself safe. Um, and wearing light colored clothing makes it a little bit easier to see if a mosquito lands on you. Um, and there's also a little bit of science behind it. Um, if you wear, you know, very dark color clothing and then a very light colored shirt, 
Um, that contrast in color can actually be a, a target for mosquitoes. Um, and, you know, they can see that contrast a little bit and they might be more willing to target you. Um, and then be very careful at sunrise and sunset. That's when most species of mosquitoes are out looking to feed, um, you know, that first hour, hour and a half at dawn and then the last, you know, two hours um, before dark and even, you know, a little bit into dark is when those mosquitoes are most active. And then the very last part of my program um, is about ticks. You know, also another bad biter. Um, so in the pictures there, you know, there's black lake tick, there's dog tick. Um, and one of the programs that Pennsylvania runs is the Dare to be Tick Aware. Um, so that's a Lyme prevention program, education program um, that was put together, I believe, by the state's Department of Health to try to get the word out um, to residents and how they can better protect themselves from Lyme disease. Some of the most common ticks in Pennsylvania, like I mentioned, the black leg tick and the American dog tick. Uh, you can see from going from left to right, we have adult female, adult male, nymph, and larvae. Um, and those are pretty much the most common ticks that we see, um, especially in Schuylkill County here doing the surveillance program. Those are the ones that we collect the most. So black leg tick is, you know, probably the most troublesome tick in Pennsylvania. That's the common transmitter of Lyme disease. Um, and if you can see by the picture on the left there, they're very small um, on that person's fingertip, um, especially the nymph and larvae. They can be hard to see if they do bite you. Um, you know, you typically won't feel them bite you. Um, and they do like to get places where, you know, you typically wouldn't look, you know, under the armpits, the back of the neck or places that they love to feed. But it's estimated that they're 329,000 cases of Lyme disease in the United States each year. Um, and that can be a pretty devastating illness if it goes undiagnosed. Um, so that's a significant number. And most of those cases do occur in the Northeast. And this is a short educational um, video that I have here that shows just how ticks grab onto us and where ticks like to hide. A lot of times when these ticks are on the blades of grass, it's on the edges of trails um, because they can sense the differences in light and they know, you know, that most possible um, meals will be walking on the trails where it's more open. Those are easier places to walk. So they will actually get to the edges of trails and reach out um, and quest and try to grab on. And ways that you can protect yourself from ticks, again, wearing the light colored clothing, um, if you're out for a hike or if you're working in your backyard, um, you know, that just makes it easier to spot ticks because they do crawl around a while before they decide to latch on. Um, so if you're wearing that light colored clothing, you might be able to see them crawling around before they can bite. Um, wearing tick repellent, a lot of times the same repellent that you use for mosquitoes also works for ticks. Um, so spraying that around your sock line, around your waistline is good ways to keep ticks from getting onto you. Walking in the middle of trails, um, if you are at, you know, a more well-known hiking area, um, well-maintained area, if you can walk in the trail away from the edges of the brush um, or where the vegetation tries to creep into the trail, um, if you don't come in contact with that, a lot of times you won't come into contact with a questing tick, um, so you won't even, you know, get them on you. And then check yourself after being outdoors um, every day after work, um, just a short tick check, um, you know, make sure you get them before they latch on. And then 
throwing your clothes in the dryer um, after you do an outdoor activity, you know, just for a short period of time, that's going to kill any tick that might be crawling around on your clothing. Um, and, you know, that's another way to protect yourself. And I always like to, you know, end the program with just, you know, be careful. Ticks are tiny. These pictures kind of really put it into perspective on how small ticks are. Um, you know, that nymph and larval stage is the real problematic tick because a lot of times you can't see those when they bite you or when they bore into your skin, um, they disappear. And with Lyme disease, the important part is really the first 24 hours, um, you know, when a tick gets latched on, if you can find that tick in that amount of time, um, it's very likely that they won't transmit Lyme disease, but then after that period of time, um, the transmission rate goes way up. So if you can, you know, do those checks after you come in from an outdoor activity and find that tick early on, um, you know, it's very good and it lowers the transmission of that Lyme disease. Thank you for, you know, tuning into the presentation. Um, I know it looked like there were some questions that popped up during. Um, so I think we'll have hopefully some time to answer those questions. Um, and I'll get out of the PowerPoint here. Kyle, thank you so much. Um, such important information you're sharing with everyone. So we really appreciate it. And yes, you are right. There are tons of questions coming in. So uh, let's begin with the questions. Okay. Um, any comments on the commercial mosquito control firms? Um, you know, they can be a help. A lot of times, um, if you just get into a regular routine, you know, they are a business. They're looking to make money like any other business. You know, they may come in at a time when you don't necessarily need a treatment. Um, but, you know, they can be great. They help out a lot of people. You know, they kill a lot of mosquitoes and they stop a lot of problems. Um, and just with our program, you know, it's typically one or two people for our county programs working it. So we, you know, try to get to everybody we can. We try to get as much coverage as we can, but, you know, we a little bit limited and short staffed when it comes to stuff like that. So, you know, if you do have the money for it, I don't think it's a terrible idea um, to try to help out your backyard. Okay, thank you. And then a follow-up question regarding commercial, uh, the commercial control companies. Now it's about ticks. Um, they're saying, any comments on the commercial tick control companies? The firm we have treat our property uses cedar and garlic oil. Yeah, and there's, um, you know, a lot of different combinations of, you know, things that you can use to try to get rid of ticks in your backyard. A lot of times um, you can really reduce your contact by creating your own barrier in your backyard. Um, so, you know, if you keep your lawn well-maintained, um, they can't survive in that habitat. There's not enough cover for them. And if you keep, um, some people keep a mulch barrier between a wood line and their backyard, or if you just even keep a well manicured area that doesn't have any leaf litter um, and you cut the brush back, those ticks, you know, won't be able to get to the edge of your yard. They won't travel through your yard um, so it can help reduce the number, you know, that you see in your backyard. Thank you, Kyle. Okay, some more questions. Um, so now we're talking about spotted lantern flies. Can the egg masses just be sprayed with alcohol while on the tree? Or when collecting the egg masses, if some fall into the ground, are they still viable? Um, so usually just spraying them with alcohol, um, it won't penetrate through that covering that they have. Um, if they don't have the covering, you know, you can probably spray them and mash them up a little bit and that'll do the job. Um, I know, I believe the USDA is doing some testing with some commercial oils um, that they're spraying on the egg masks to see if that penetrates them and kills the eggs. And, you know, if you were to scrape it and just let them fall on the ground, there is a chance that those eggs could remain viable and hatch out. So that's why we always try to collect them into a container as best we can. Um, you know, or if we are noticing that you're missing a lot when you're scraping, a lot of times you can just press against the tree on that egg mass. And I mean, all the eggs just kind of squish out and smash. Um, so that's a good way to get rid of them too. Awesome, thank you. So the next questions are about the mosquitoes. Um, how much time between the egg laying and fully flying? Um, so. You know, in the middle of summer, if we get the perfect conditions, um, we can see that occur in as little as five days. But typically, um, it's right around a week 
Um, if our temperatures are a little off, it slows the whole process down. So it could be 10 days, but right now, um, with the rain we just had and the temperatures, I would say it would probably be right around a week. A week, okay. And I'm thinking of all the different like uh, places on my back porch that could be collecting water that I'm gonna go dump out after this program. Um, okay, Kyle, another question. So for mosquitoes, what is the lifespan of a female and a male? And how many times uh, can a female lay eggs? Yeah, it really um, depends on the species. A lot of the common ones that we have around here, um, you know, they can lay two or three um, broods of eggs. You know, they could possibly take two or three blood meals then, <coughs> eggs. Um, and, you know, we'll see them last a few weeks. Um, some species, you know, can last an entire summer. Um, it's really tough to say. I mean, we do have 60 different species of mosquitoes, each one with a little bit, you know, different area that they live, a little bit different style of living. Um, but usually it's a few weeks um, if I put, you know, a number on it. Okay, thank you. Okay, some questions about mineral oil. So one of our viewers has a beehive and is concerned to know if mineral oil would be dangerous for the bees. Um, um, okay, yeah, for our mineral oil treatments, um, we actually just use a little household um, sprayer, so a little spray bottle, and we concentrate that to just areas that are artificial containers. Um, so if there's a possibility that there could be any other aquatic invertebrates, um, you know, any amphibians in the pockets of water, um, you know, we won't use the mineral oil in that situation. I just did a treatment today um, where I treated water that was inside a tire. Um, and, you know, typically we just see mosquito larvae in those areas. Um, so then, you know, I'll use that treatment there. It'll create a small film over the surface of the water um, for a few hours, and then that just begins to dissolve and break down but in that amount of time, it'll kill the mosquito larvae. Um, so the way we use the mineral oil, um, it wouldn't you know, have an effect on beehives. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there was a question about a tick. Uh, could a tick survive running through a washing machine cycle? I know you said the dryer could kill them. Um, it would be tough for a tick to survive through the wash. Um, you know, With the amount of water coming in and draining out, there'd be a good chance that it probably would get drained. Um, but you know, if it were to be in the center of a big ball of clothing, uh, there's the possibility through the washer, we put it through the dryer because it'll dry the tick out, um, it'll burn the tick up. Um, and that's what, you know, was recommended for us to put out there, um, you know, about the program that running it through just a dry cycle will get rid of the ticks the best. Okay, great, thank you. I think we got most of the questions. Let me just double check. Um, I know I personally had a question about the spotted lanternfly. Uh, do we know how it originally came over from Asia to, to be in Berks County? Uh, we believe that it came over on like a granite shipment or a big stone shipment um, mm -hmm. in Berks County, which most likely means that it traveled over as an egg mass um, because the adults and nymph stages um, almost you know, have to feed pretty consistently. Um, you know, they need a few meals a day at the minimum. Um, so for them to make that trip over, you know, as a larva or as a instar or as an adult, you know, is a very likely. So it probably came over as an egg mass. And then, you know, once they reach those right temperatures, those right conditions, they hatched out um, and probably found tree of heaven, you know, somewhere very close that they could feed on um, because it pretty much everywhere and then you know they could just expand from there. Got you. Thank you. And another question about the spotted lanternfly egg masses. Um, are there other um, insects that are native and that we wouldn't want to harm that have similar looking egg masses that we really need to be careful to make sure we're destroying the, cor the correct one? Um, pretty unique looking. Yeah they're pretty unique. Um, I haven't really come across anything similar. Um, and, you know, in any of the kind of trainings, we haven't come, you know, they haven't told us about anything similar. Uh, really, the only thing that people have compared it to was sort of like a gypsy moth egg mass. Okay. Um, but that, you know, those would be something that we'd want to get rid of too. Um, but typically, the egg masses are on the undersides of objects. Um, they're about an inch, inch and a half long. And it almost just looks like you took your thumb and you wiped a mark of clay you know, on the underside of a branch, 
And a lot of times females lay their egg masses close to other females. Um, so if you find one, there's a good chance that there's, you know, six, eight or 10 egg masses grouped together. Um, so you, you really don't see too many things that look similar. Um, okay. Thank you, thank you. Um, and another question, um, at Hawk Mountain, I know we're in a quarantine for the spots and lantern flies. So anytime we take a company vehicle off the sanctuary, we have to do a thorough check of the vehicle, like underneath in the wheel wells, and we're looking for any sign of a spots and lantern fly. Um, and we have to document it. Is that something that individual people in the community can do on their own, uh, not necessarily documenting it, but just looking on their vehicle uh, before you know traveling just to try to deter a uh, spreading yeah i mean we always encourage that if you're in an area where it's known to have lantern flies i mean taking 30 seconds a minute to walk around your car make sure there's none you know in a very visible area you know we're not saying that you have to take your air filter out and everything you know and <laughs> right right <laughs> take everything apart but if you could take 30 seconds before you leave um, and maybe find a few lantern flies if they are trying to hide there. It doesn't take very much for them to get started in a new area. And if you follow their distribution on a map, it kind of follows all the major roadways that were leading out of Berks County. Um, so we've seen them snake up 61 and then branch out right off of 61 and the same with 78. Um, you kind of see pockets pop up right off the highways first, which we most likely think were dropped off by vehicles. Right. Right. Well, we had another question come in. Um, so is there um, a natural fungus that can kill the lanternfly? Um, one of the viewers commented that they, ha they live below Berks County and two years ago they had tons of spotted lanternflies and don't have any now and they heard something about a fungus could have been helping to eradicate them. Yeah, um, so I believe it was two years ago um, when we had the torrential rains there in July for a few days in some places, you know, seen 20 plus inches of rain over a couple of days. But what we did see after that then was the lanternflies did develop a fungus um, and they think it was from the conditions being so damp for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it was uh, in the bacillus family. And I know USDA um, is working on developing a spray um, you know, whether it's some kind of granular treatment, uh, aerial treatment, fog treatment um, that uses that fungus against the lanternfly. Um, I know they're taking some steps, some small um, area treatments to make sure that it doesn't have a large effect on any other insect species. Um, but it is, you know, a bright spot in our treatment process um, because right now we kind of work by treating individual trees. Mm -hmm. um, that can get, you know, very time consuming if we are in an area that has a lot of lantern flies, but they're working, you know, with that um, fungus to try to create a widespread spray that we can use. And should people, if they see a big inf infestation, should they contact you or the conservation district? Yeah, um, our, all 14 Southeast counties um, have some sort of program, um, you know, areas that are harder hit by the lantern flies. Um, you know, might have uh, a person like myself working it out. I know USDA also has, I think, six offices around southeastern PA, and um, they do a lot of work and eradication for the lanternflies too. Uh, but yeah, reaching out to your local conservation district. Um, if you go online, you can actually visit Penn State Extension. They have a reporting tool for the spotted lanternfly, and they have just a ton of information about how homeowners can do um, treatments in their backyard to try to get rid of them and just general information. Um, yeah, so there's, you know, some different outlets that you can try to get a hold of. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I think that about wraps it up. And Kyle, we just had some comments coming in that it was a fantastic presentation. And I can't thank you enough, Kyle. This is such important information and spreading awareness, educating people is so important. So thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge uh, with us. And thank you to our wonderful audience for joining us. It always means a lot to us. We're able to connect virtually during these times. So thank you. Um, we hope to see you on the mountain soon. Our sanctuary is open. Our trails are open. Um, check out our website for details about our um, social distancing modifications. And um, we do have some events being offered on site on our outdoor amphitheater, socially distanced. We have our migration kickoff on Saturday, August 15th. 
like all day, like 11 to 3, we're going to have free programs, live Raptors Up Close programs, Name That Raptor, Naturalists in the Garden, Hawk Mountain History, a sidewalk sale, I'm probably forgetting something. So that will be a fun day to visit. And as always, we have uh, lots of virtual programs as well coming your way soon. So here's what's in store. Um, I did want to let everyone know that we had originally scheduled uh, basic birding skills with Holly Merker for this Friday, August 7th at 4 o'clock. However, we do have to reschedule that, so we apologize for that. Uh, the date for the reschedule will be coming in the future. We don't know that date yet, perhaps in the fall. Next Wednesday, August 12th, we have Reading Sign and Tracking Wildlife with Dan Lynch of the Pennsylvania Game Commission at 1 o'clock p.m. Next Thursday, August 13th, Sanctuary Storytime, Are You a Spider? at 11 o'clock a.m. and there will be a live uh, tarantula ambassador joining us for that program, which is very exciting. And then on Friday, August 14th, we have Mapping Our Knowledge on Raptor Population Genetics with Marianne Goosey at 4 o'clock p.m. Have a wonderful day, everyone, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye for now.